made a few observations while meditating on that text that we just heard read. And the first is probably the most obvious, that love is from God, love is of God, and God is love. And we could probably spend our whole lives pondering that grand sweeping idea, and I do want to revisit it in a moment, but there's the weightier matter of my second observation So let's get the chewy stuff out of the way up front, right? Like eating vegetables or doing cardio. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If love is from God and love is of God and God is love, then my second observations are questions. How is the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth sacrificial? And how does the crucifixion of Jesus exemplify the love from God, the love of God. That's where we're going to spend the first part of our time together today. Buckle up. I want to make a bold statement. I don't know if I should stand or sit for this. I'm going to stand. All right. Bold statement. What distinguishes Christianity is not... Miracles, sacred scripture, prophecies fulfilled or otherwise, clever symbols or metaphors, or a robust systematic theology. It's something else that challenges us dynamically. All that religious stuff isn't really that unique. Miracles, Divine titles, prophecy, spiritual language, sacrificial laws, codes of conduct, and even resurrection stories are all found throughout the world's belief systems, and none of which disrupt the story of our status quo very much. What I mean by that is that we can hold deeply and even champion many ideas about God, people, and reality in a way that generally have no lasting consequences on the way we live or the world around us. We can be good religious people and stay almost exactly the same. What continues to unsettle and perplex people about Jesus is the profound revelation that the crucifixion exposes about God. The crucifixion of Jesus challenges our status quo, revealing to all humanity a God who would rather endear and endure suffering and shame and scorn on behalf of us than to condemn us. How does the crucifixion of Jesus exemplify the love of God? It exposes us to a God who would rather endure suffering, shame, and scorn on our behalf than condemn us. This God, the God that Jesus revealed, does not sit up there somewhere but becomes like us, becomes one of us. This is not a distant God who is content to observe our plight from afar, but enters and heals it from the inside out. That story should change everything. He loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice. For our sins. But here's another important plot twist. Even the nature 
of the sacrifice is different. This is not an example of some archaic, barbaric, blood sacrifice to appease a wrathful God or storm deity so that he will bless our crops or make our women fertile or make our, I don't know, victorious in battle. This is not that kind of sacrifice. You know, the, the ancient Israelite scriptures and the sacrificial system, it kind of gets a bit of a bad rap. And to be honest with you, if I had to bring a lamb, we've talked about this in youth group, if I had to bring a lamb to church every single week and then kill it in front of everybody, I think I would kind of get a bad rap too. It's a little bit weird. But the point of it was this, as silly and barbaric and gross even as it seems, the Hebrew scriptures, the old covenant, the law is much more concerned with us remembering that this is all about a gracious invitation from God. The sacrificial system was a provisional, a temporary way for God to reach humanity. It's much more concerned with the invitation than the system itself. The ritual sprinkling of blood symbolically decontaminated all traces of death and defilement from God's people, restoring communion, an atoning sacrifice. That's what atonement is. The restoration of communion. How is the crucifixion of Jesus sacrificial? How does it exemplify the love of God? Well, here's the crazy part. Romans 3 verses 24 through 25 says, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. Who put forward the sacrifice? God. In and through Christ, the earliest Jesus followers believed that God initiated a sacrifice on behalf of humanity out of love and in solidarity with us for our sake. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may, na- may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. What stands out about Jesus's death, what stands out about the crucifixion, is not a lesson in the lengths necessary to appease God, but the lengths God would go to demonstrate God's love for us. Laying down God's own life for us, which is different than instead of us. Cardio. I want to also use today's text to show an example of how this truth remains a scandal to some and foolishness to others, even in the church. 1 John 4, 17 through 18 says, Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not yet reached perfection in love. I've been in Christian spaces long enough and around enough church folks, myself included at time, to know we have a problem with this unshakable fundamentalistic mentality about behaving and believing just right, which is always rooted in fear. So for instance, someone might say, well, how, if I do this thing, how do I know God will forgive me? Right? Right? If, what if I don't make the right choice? What if I make the wrong decision is, and God is angry with me? Do you think God is going to do something if I make the wrong decision? To which my, my friends, that is not the God revealed in and through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus reveals once and for all what we all know deep down already, that the ground of reality is gracious, expansive love. First John says, whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. If you think God is stingy with grace, or if you're scared of God because you don't think God understands what it's like to be a fallible, finite human being, or you believe that you're just one wrong move away from damnation, I think you've missed it. God is not in love with some future idealized version of you. As he is, so are we. Already. In love. I titled this, uh, I hate titles. I titled this one, Another One All About Love. Uh, and there were a few other, uh, What is Love was a good title for a little while. L-O-M-L was a title for a while. I occasionally hear criticisms like, it can't all be about love. Or, God loves, but. I don't, I can't say that about Jess or Dexter. I love you, but. I mean, I can. And probably I do act that way on occasion. Sometimes these criticisms are accompanied by uh, kind of an implicit indictment that somehow a message about love is soft on sin, whatever that even means. And I think behind this criticism is an inclination to think that whatever sin is, it must be a failure to uphold a list of rules or naughty behaviors that we're meant to avoid in order to keep God happy. And I think it's much deeper than that, much more profound than that, much more interlaced with how reality is structured and functions. The problem is that this misconception is compounded when well-intentioned Christians set free from the old covenant law that Hebrew says is obsolete, outdated, and disappearing, substitute the New Testament as a new kind of law, and therefore we fail to transcend the same legalism that Jesus is trying to, to condemn in the first place. I don't know what it is about us, but we, we, we would rather have to put ourselves under something and be obedient than to grow and mature in a way that we can live in the world with openness and love, probably because that's a lot harder. The problem is that our world is built on a foundation and sustained by disunion and separation. Sin is the unavoidable consequence of operating and living from this orientation of disunion and separation, which is reinforced repeatedly over and over in a thousand ways. It's much more profound than just a list of rules. It is a counter-cultural way to exist in the world. Like every human being who has ever lived, myself included, we willfully elevate ourselves as well as our preferred institutions and systems when making choices. These choices, whether actively or passively, often result in mistakenly resisting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control in favor of things like instant gratification and social positioning, and power dynamics, even within our own home. Think of like most of the arguments you get with in your, in your house, right? Even your kids, right? It's a, it's a battle of who's in charge. Like, I, I'm the boss. I'm not, you're not the boss. When we continue to sin this way, aiming without even knowing where the target is, and thus always missing the mark, we enable the powers and principalities that Christ's death freed us from to resume their distortion, cutting us off 
from our awareness of union with God and with one another. And then we're guilty and have to face the consequences of our resistance. And in the Bible, that language is judgment. So sin is real. We're all culpable for it. And judgment is real. And we'll get to that in a minute. And judgment can be celebrated. But Jesus was never interested in an ethic of mere obedience. That is an inferior morality. The lawyers and Pharisees were experts at knowing, teaching, and following the rules. But Jesus said that our righteousness requires us to go beyond the righteousness of the Pharisees, to go beyond obedient rule following from a matter of the law to the matter of the spirit. The kingdom is not about adopting a set of beliefs. It is about embracing an entirely new way of being. Roger Wolsey says, Jesus hoped to wake us up to realizing who we really are as God's children and embolden us so that we might truly live as God intends. Christ's sacrifice does not just remove our guilt before the law, it forever puts to death the inferior morality of mere obedience and beckons us toward a kingdom ethic of elevated awareness, integrity, mutuality, and compassion. Jesus invites us into a new, liberated, transformed way of being human. He valued spiritual vitality and integrity above external rule following. He elevated compassion and healing over purity and boundary keeping. He demonstrated an inclusive wholeness that cared for all, welcomed all, and celebrated all, not just a few holy chosen few. And he promised that those with faith like little children, those who were born again, would see the all encompassing presence of divine love, the emerging kingdom of God among us and within us, and we would be transformed to live sacrificially so that like him we may enter into the wound of the world and heal it from the inside out. It is easy to be religious. It is hard to love like Jesus. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We are held accountable for the consequences of our resistance to life and light and love. The the Bible speaks about judgment in many different ways. And again, we can celebrate that. And that might seem weird from a guy who's up here saying, love is from God and God is love. But here's the thing. It's only weird if, if the framework for judgment is that God only loves you and your tribe. But if God loves everyone, if God loves the world, if God's love is so expansive then woven into the fabric of the created order are both the penalty of our error and the potential to make amends for it. Only when we fail to work, do the work of reparation do the consequences start to pile up and collapse on top of us. Sin is real. Judgment is real. We will experience the consequences of our sin. And if we do not do the work of reparation, we will collapse under the weight of them. In the Bible, this work of amending, of mending what is broken, is called repentance. And genuine repentance is never invoked by fear, especially the fear of punishment. The work of genuine repentance is always, ever, and only provoked by grace, mercy, and love. Repentance is our response to grace, mercy, and love that is shown to us so that we can then show it back to others and thus create a cycle of mutual reconciliation. 
the remedy for our disunion, for our separation, which breeds sin, is communion. A divinely inspired, humble, love-saturated union with God and one another. Do you remember when I introduced the Lord's Supper? And I said, every seven years or so, every cell in your body, blah, 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 from eyelashes to esophagus. It gets weirder than that. I'm going to plagiarize, just read straight from an article, so this didn't come from me. You might think of yourself as a collection of macroscopic organs and the cells that make them up. I don't think of myself that way, but some people do, I guess. That you're nothing more but bones, muscles, skin, and the other organs inside of you. But from a cellular standpoint... That only makes up 4% of your cells in your body. The other 90% are split roughly, evenly, between your blood cells and bacteria cells that live on and in your body. So let me just, we are mainly blood and bacteria. I know. And the 4% of us that is not blood and bacteria is made up overwhelmingly of just four elements, oxygen, Carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And still, there are more atoms in each of our body than there are stars in the universe. Next slide, Sarah. There we go. The same article says, on average, you're made of hundreds of billions of atoms that were, a year ago, Inside each and every other person on earth. If you take a deep breath, then exhale, by the time a year goes by, approximately one atom from the, your breath will wind up in every other person on earth's lungs at any moment in time. At the most fundamental level, we are all incredibly connected. Union. Which brings me back to my first observation. Love is from God. Love is of God. God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God And God abides in them. Divine love is the underlying guiding principle for all reality. And I would add that God, divine love, lives and breathes through us. A pastoral voice I appreciate said, There's a oneness to all this, and yet it breaks down into all these apparent differences and distinction because love find that really interesting. You can't love without distinction. How boring is that? Just a room full of Zacks. I wouldn't even want that. I wouldn't wish that on somebody. The entire created order, invisible and visible, is reconciled to God through Christ and finds the fullness of its meaning and purpose in divine love made manifest in varied, diverse ways among us and through us. It is inescapable and unmissable if we have eyes to see it. And this is my final point for the day. Because God is love... And the love from God, love of God, looks like the selfless sacrifice of Christ, a sacrifice made not only for you or me, but all humanity, then we should love others in the exact same way. This is the foundation for a kingdom ethic of expanding compassion and consciousness. John 15, today's lectionary gospel reading says, Jesus says, remain in me. And I will remain in you. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. This is my commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. Children, co-workers, spouses, neighbors, 
enemies. It begins with losing oneself to God's inescapable loving presence revealed through Christ. And I would just wonder today, have you lost yourself to the inescapable loving presence of God revealed through Christ? It begins with remembering that, that we are dust and breath. And this form will only be here for a while So why not spend it on something bigger than ourselves? And it begins with being undone, coming apart at the seams, having the tissue and sinew that keep us from reaching out to others and from praying for God to rip our arms apart so that our hearts and our hugs could be wider than we ever dreamed of. But how can I be sure of all of this? How can I stand here today and say that I know that we have this union with God and this union with each other and this union with the world? How can we know this profound remedy for our disunion and separation is this communion? And I would say that Paul seems inclined and I along with him that to to know that is to look towards the cross of Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The journey of the cross is the narrow gate. It is the straight path, the self-emptying, self-sacrificial love of God that was displayed on the doorpost of the cosmos is now the very door that we walk through as we allow the same love to be lived through us. After all, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Amen. I think we should just sit with that for a moment. Gracious God, Father, Creator and Sustainer, we come before you humbled by your love. We confess that we are in need of your love and that our love often pales in comparison. Help us first to receive that love for ourselves. Please enter into those hollow, dark, tired places, those places that need healing those places that just need a touch. And then may we love from that place as we are filled up. God, we confess that sometimes that is merely not saying the things that we want to say. And sometimes that will look like giving ourselves away in ways we would never imagine. Bring our attention and our awareness to where we fail to love as you have loved and allow us to receive your love in forgiveness and to extend that forgiveness in kind. We thank you for Jesus who shows us what your love looks like. May we love like him. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.